Hey Optimancers, Chris here. So I'm going to talk today about how I use D&D Beyond. This is not intended as an advertisement for D&D Beyond. They are not affiliated with this channel. It is a service, however, that I personally use and I find it to be a convenience for me when I play Dungeons & Dragons, when I'm looking up rules, when I'm making characters, when I'm designing encounters. For all these things, I think D&D Beyond works significantly better than working with just the books. And I want to show how it works so that if it's something that would be of use to you, you would know what benefits you would get from it and the costs involved and the limitations involved so that you can make an informed decision for yourself. Now, I am sure there are functions of D&D Beyond that I am unfamiliar with, uh, so I'll be sharing what I use D&D Beyond for. And if you use D&D Beyond, maybe you'll learn some things. And if you don't use D&D Beyond, maybe you'll understand why I like this service. Now, I can't go over everything because first of all, there's things D&D Beyond can be used for that I have limited knowledge on. And also, there's a lot to cover. So in this video, I'm going to be covering the following topics. Number one, how to use D&D Beyond for free. Number two, content purchasing and getting the most value for the minimum investment. Number three, I'm going to give you a tour of the website and an overview of the services it provides. Number four, I'm going to show you how their encounter builder works. Number five, we're going to go over search results and search filters. Number six, using D&D Beyond to create a character. Number seven, using D&D Beyond as your character sheet. And number eight, we're going to go over the limitations and drawbacks of the digital platform. I figure that's a good place to start, and it's going to result in a fairly hefty video. So if you want to refer to any of these topics specifically, I've timestamped the video timeline so you can jump to the information you want. First, let's talk about using D&D Beyond for free. So I'm just going to go through this quickly. If you want to mess around with D&D Beyond, you can do so without spending any money. You just go to dndbeyond.com. If you don't purchase anything, you'll have access to the basic rules only. These are the stripped down version of the player's handbook you would get with a starter set or the free rules that are online. It's all free to use and it's free to use on D&D Beyond. You can make a character, you can play around with the character sheet, and you can see if you like it. This can all be done on your PC, it can be done on your tablet, it also can be done on your phone. And if you haven't purchased anything on D&D Beyond, I think it is a good idea for you to do this first. And this way you can see if it's worth it for you to actually invest anything. But if you make the decision to use D&D Beyond, then it's not going to be free uh, beyond these basic rules. And they're not going to be a lot of help for you at most tables. So let's move on and talk about purchasing content. So here is the first thing you should know if you purchase things digitally is that when we are buying the player's handbook on D&D Beyond, we're not actually purchasing the player's handbook. So like if you buy the player's handbook and you buy a physical copy, you have a book and you put it on your bookshelf and it never changes unless you make some changes to it. If you purchase this on D&D Beyond, what you're actually purchasing is a license to access it. But purchasing a digital copy on D&D Beyond is very different than purchasing, say, a PDF. I mean, you can read it like a PDF on D&D Beyond if that's what you want to do. But if that's all you're doing, you might have better options than D&D Beyond. The point of purchasing these licenses on D&D Beyond is so that we can access this content with the services that D&D Beyond provides. Now, one of the advantages or potentially disadvantage, depending on how you look at it, of D&D Beyond is that if we have access to this content, it is automatically updated with any errata that's released. Now, some people don't like that because they want to have the original book that they purchased. Of course, we're not purchasing a book, we're licensing access to it. But if you purchase a book, it always stays the same and some people like that. For me, I don't like that. In fact, I just played in a game of Pathfinder 2 where I made a character and then found out my character was built wrong because I had the first printing of the Pathfinder 2 book and there had been errata released that changed my build. That doesn't happen with D&D Beyond. With D&D Beyond, you always are using the official version. So let's talk a little bit about the pricing. So I have the player's handbook up here and you can see that it costs $30 to buy the player's handbook on D&D Beyond or purchase the license. Uh, now, if you buy a physical copy of the player's handbook, at least if you buy it new, 
you will spend significantly more than this. So you are saving on that. Of course, it's cheaper for them to give you this access because they save on the printing costs and all that stuff. So they are passing some of those savings along to you. But if you don't want to buy the entire player's handbook, you do have other options. I'm just going to scroll down here and you're going to see additional purchase options. So we have all the backgrounds, the subclasses, the feats, uh, and if you wanted to purchase all the subclasses, it would cost you $10. You wouldn't have access to anything else in the player's handbook, but if you were building a character and you wanted to access the battle master, then you would be able to do it. And if you just wanted the battle master, you could purchase that for $2. And the $2 price is pretty flat. So you'll see that the subclasses, they're all $2. The feats, they're all $2. The sub races, everything is $2. Even a spell is $2. I'm not sure I think these are all of equivalent value. Like I would never pay $2 for a background, uh, but they still cost $2. But basically I think for simplicity, they've just made everything $2. Now let's say you bought the Battle Master, just the Battle Master, and you spent the $2 for it. Then later you decided, you know what, I maybe want more in the player's handbook. Maybe I should just purchase the entire thing. What they will do is when you buy it, from this price, they will remove any purchases you've already made. So if you purchase the Battle Master, maybe another subclass, then you would have invested $4 already. So they would take $4 off this price when you bought the entire player's handbook. Now they do give you one additional option and that is to purchase the compendium content only. So in this case, $20, and you would own the player's handbook or access to the player's handbook. The issue with doing compendium content only is it allows you to read the player's handbook, but it doesn't allow you to use it for all the other services that D&D Beyond gives you. And the reason I use D&D Beyond isn't so I have digital copies of books. I do it for all the additional services it provides some of which I'll be going over in the rest of this video. Just be aware, if you buy the compendium content only, those services won't be available to you. So just keep that in mind. If you're thinking, wow, I can save $10, you're just getting a copy of the book. You're not getting all this other stuff. Now, if you want to buy a bunch of books at once, you can buy bundles. I've got the legendary bundle up here. And what it will do is it will give you access to a whole bunch of books and it's usually at a reduced price. Once again, if you already own some of the content, they'll remove the price of that content from the total. So this 325.11 you see on my screen, that's what it would cost me to get the legendary bundle because I already own a lot of content. Probably costs a lot of people more than that. Now, if we go to the marketplace tab, you can see the stores there. That's where you're gonna buy books. And then we have another tab here for subscriptions. And I just wanna go over those for a bit. Uh, so if we scroll down here, we're gonna see there are two subscriptions you can have. And the first thing I just wanna make it clear, you don't need these. If you wanna use D&D Beyond, you do not need to subscribe. Here's why you might wanna consider a subscription. If you are planning to make many characters on the platform, you will need a subscription. You can have, I believe, six characters without a subscription. And if you get the hero tier, which is $2.99 a month, you can now make unlimited characters. And it says you can add publicly shared homebrew content. You have early access to new tools, create unlimited encounters and monthly subscriber perks. I'll tell you what those monthly subscriber perks are. It's usually some different color set of digital dice. I get emails all the time that I've got some new digital dice that I never use. Uh, then we have the master level subscription, which gives you all the stuff the hero gives. Plus it allows you to share unlock content with other players. When the master subscription might be of use to you is if you have a lot of content on D&D Beyond, uh, because then what you can do is if you're playing with players who don't have a D&D Beyond account, you can create a campaign, they join the campaign, and then they will have access to all your stuff. So they won't have to pay for it at all. Uh, and it will cost you $6 a month. So those are the two subscription levels. Personally, I am a master level subscriber, but that is largely because I do own a lot of stuff. And with the YouTube and all that, I end up playing a lot of D&D. And if I'm going to play with somebody who doesn't have D&D Beyond subscription, I can share my content with them and then they can use it. And 
it is very handy for virtual play. The master tier used to be able to give you the ability to create up to three campaigns with 12 players each, so you could, in theory, share your content with up to 36 players. When COVID started, they upped it to five campaigns, so then you could share with up to 60 different players. Now, I don't know if they will at some point remove those extra two again. They haven't as of yet, uh, but currently you can make up to five campaigns for sharing content with the master tier. Now, you might wonder what happens if you pay to access a product and then that product becomes discontinued. Uh, so, of course, I can't tell you what's going to happen in the future, but I can tell you how D&D Beyond has handled this up to now. So, Volo's Guide to Monsters is a discontinued book. If you want to purchase it now on D&D Beyond, you can't. It is not available to you. But I purchased it before it was discontinued, and so what happened is I still have access to it. So, uh, here's Volo's Guide to Monsters, and I can click on it and research the rules that I want to from Volo's Guide to Monsters if I make a character. I can access Volo's Guide to Monsters, uh, even if I'm doing like searches, like let's say I'm searching for monsters. Well, uh, the Volo's Guide to Monsters content will show up in that search and I can still select it and use it and all that stuff. So basically my access to it hasn't changed at all. Uh, what it does do is it labels all that stuff as legacy content. So I know it's part of the discontinued rules, but it's there if I want it. I paid for the license, so I still have that license to access this content. So that's how that stuff has been handled, at least up to now. So I, I just wanna kinda of do a brief tour of D&D uh, Beyond before we get into character building. Uh, so there is a search bar. The search function ain't great, I gotta, I gotta tell you. But like if I wanna look up, say, conditions, so maybe I'm looking up the invisible condition, I can type in invisible and it will bring up the invisible stalker and there's invisible so there we would have the invisible condition uh, but if you have like one letter out of place it will not know what you're talking about so let's say I just had a spelling error and I put the N before the I and then it, it can't figure that out um, so <laughs> you have to spell it perfectly uh, where I have trouble is if I'm looking up particular monsters I don't always know exactly how they're spelled uh, and then I'll do this search function and it will give me this result. Uh, but most of the navigating I do on D&D Beyond is in this gray bar right here. And I basically personally use nothing from media to the right. Um, there is forums if you want to communicate with other D&D Beyond users. Um, and often they'll post updates in terms of technical bugs and that kind of thing in the forums. Uh, but like media, new player guide, uh, subscribe. I assume that's just the subscription. Just going to verify. Yep, that's all it is. Uh, so I, I never use those ones. But uh, tools also, I, I personally don't use this particular submenu because if I want to use the character builder, I access it through a different way. And same thing with the encounters. Uh, but these three, collections, game rules, and sources, those I use constantly. So... Collections, if I want to make a character the way I do it, is I go to My Characters, and I'll bring that up, and there we are, and it says I have 242 characters of unlimited slots, that's because I'm a subscriber, remember if you're not a subscriber you only get 6, uh, obviously with my channel there's no way I could do that, uh, but if I want to create a character then I click right there, and that's how I can create a character. The next thing I'm going to show you here under collections is my encounters. Now this says it's in beta, uh, so I have access, but to my understanding, if you're not a subscriber, you wouldn't be able to use this. Though it's a pretty good tool, I hope it gets out of beta pretty soon. Uh, so you click on it and it brings up encounters and then what you can do is create new encounter. So I've got name your encounter, so we'll call it um, I don't know, we're going to fight Beholder, so we'll call it the Beholder Encounter. And then it says, number of characters 5, average party level 10. And then we have a Manage Characters uh, tab here. So let's manage characters. And if I want, say, only 4 characters, I can just remove one. And if they're level 15, I can just alter them all to level 15. Uh, and what it will do, hang on a moment, there we are. Whoops, I don't want to add a character. And then 
if we leave, it automatically saves it and changes it. And then what we can do is add monsters into the encounter. And this encounter summary right over here is going to tell us the difficulty of the encounter and the total experience points of the encounter. So let's add our beholder. So we've added our beholder and we can see it is still an easy encounter. Don't want an easy encounter. So maybe the beholder has some minions. So what would they have? Well, maybe they would have quaggoths. So let's add some quaggoths. All right, so there's the quaggoths. Let's add one in and see what it does. Now we've got a medium encounter. Let's add another one, hard encounter. Oh, and it's me. So let's add a whole bunch and make it super deadly. All right. Um, and what you can also do is just over here on the right, you can adjust the numbers as well. So I could add, let's make it 10 beholders. See, so it'll tell you how much experience it is, but let's go ahead and turn it back into a more reasonable encounter. So I'm gonna just remove some of this stuff until we get to say a hard encounter. There we are. And then sometimes that's enough for me. So I just wanted to find out how difficult the encounter would be and that is done. So if all you wanna do is develop an encounter just to know what the challenge rating is, what the difficulty is, what the uh, experience points will be. You can use the encounter builder for that, but there is a fair bit more functionality for it. Let's say you actually have a campaign, so you have set players for that campaign, and you wanted to make an encounter for them. So if you are playing on a virtual tabletop, this can be useful, but this particular tool I think is really useful also if you are playing in person. So if you play in person and you just have books, just watch what this can do. So we're gonna to go to collections, we're gonna to go to my encounters, I'm gonna create a new encounter, and then I'm gonna click on manage characters, and I'm going to select the 50K celebration. You can see I can select any of my campaigns, and when I select the 50K celebration, it's gonna bring up those characters. So then we're gonna leave there, and now it is selected to our characters for that campaign. Now we're gonna create an encounter, and Let's say that encounter, I want it to be reasonably difficult because they're 20th level characters, and I want to narrow my search results so that I have more powerful monsters. I can slide this challenge rating bar to kind of the window of challenge ratings I want to find. Then let's say I want to find a particular location. So let's say they're traveling in the Underdark. I can go to Environment. Then I can scroll down till I find Underdark, click it and then it's going to limit me to just Underdark creatures. So these are now all Underdark creatures that are within the challenge rating I'm looking for. So let's make an encounter for them. Let's say they're gonna encounter some Drow. So we'll call it the Drow Encounter. And probably wanna start with a Drow Matron Mother, so let's add that, and we can see it's already a medium encounter. And let's say she has a Drow Favored Consort, so we'll add that. It's now a deadly encounter, but these guys are pretty good players, so we're going to add yet another Drow favored consort, and we have our encounter. So now I'm gonna save it, and I'll show you here how this works. So our encounter comes up. Now we can click Run Encounter. So you would do this during the game, and we start with a combat tracker. So we have an initiative tracker here, and what we can do is have our players roll initiative, and then we can just type in their initiative amounts. Or if you want, you can just auto roll initiative, and then same thing for the drow, we can auto roll initiative. Uh, so normally what I would do is I'd let the players roll their initiative, players like to roll their own initiatives, and then auto roll initiative for all the enemies. Very handy if you have a big combat, you'll get all the initiatives rolled immediately. Then we're gonna click start. So it puts us in order, and we can see the drow matron mother has one initiative, and it's gonna show us that it's round one, turn one. And this is very handy if you're tracking things. So. Let's say the Drow Matron Mother casts a spell that is gonna last one minute. Well, we are tracking our rounds now, so we know when round 10 comes around, that is probably going to go down. The other thing is we can track her hit points on here. So somebody just did 45 points of damage to her, so we'll click 45 damage, and it'll track the hit points for us. This is very handy if you are a DM. Tracking all the hit points, especially in big encounters, is really difficult. The other really nice thing is it is showing us what the hit points are currently for our characters. So we can see that Blorp currently has 94 hit points. As a DM, sometimes you wanna know that information, but you don't wanna always be asking the players how many hit points you have left. Well, we can see it. Then after the Drow Matron Mother's turn is done, we click next and then it'll take us down the initiative order. 
And when the round is complete, you can see the round has switched to round two. Uh, and then it will just continue to do that until the encounter is over. Uh, so I think this is a really nice tool. Now, if you are a DM, you got to realize just how handy this is. Because if you play in person, tracking initiative is a pain. Tracking hit points, especially if you have several creatures, is an even bigger pain. And another thing that's a real big pain is constantly flipping between entries in the monster manual. Got to find the drow matron mother. Okay, now I got to find the drow favorite consort. And in some cases, you might even have to flip between different books. Here, we can just click on Drow Matron Mother, and the stats come up. Uh, so if you are playing in person, this is going to save you a ton of time in flipping through books. Now, like I said, this is still in beta, though I have used this several times. I have never once run into a bug, so I'm not sure why it's still in beta. Maybe other people are running into bugs, but for me, the functionality has been 100% so far. All right, also on collections, we have Homebrew Collection, Homebrew Creations, and My Dice. I don't use these very much. Once in a while, I'll do something Homebrew if I want to, you know, roll it off of D&D Beyond. Uh, personally, I tend to use Roll20, and I find to create Homebrew Monsters is easier on Roll20, so I tend to do that instead. But you can do it. Um, I'm not the best one to talk to about that. But you can see over on the right side... Uh, you can also check out other people's homebrew. So if I click Browse Monsters, there's a bunch of homebrew stuff, and you can see that people have voted on whether they like them or not. So if you see something with like really bad negative points, it's probably not very good. Uh, anyway, I don't tend to use that very much either. Game rules I use all the time because this is the best way. If you want to search stuff, I find this is better than the general search bar. So class information, spell information, races, monsters, feats, backgrounds, equipment, magic items, and vehicles. So let's say I want to make a character and I want him to be like a fire mage. Well, what I would probably do is I would start with looking at the spells and then I can go to show advanced filters and I can go to damage type and just put in, I just want you to show me fire spells. And then I filter spells, takes a couple seconds, and then it's going to give me a list of all the spells that list fire damage uh, and then that will narrow my search a lot easier to determine what spells I want on the character uh, and if I decide you know my character is going to be a wizard so I'll only be able to cast wizard spells then I can just click up here and then it's going to filter out all the results so these are only spells available to wizards then you just click on the spell and it will bring up the spell description this is one of the chief conveniences that I really like about D&D Beyond. Like if you have books and you're trying to do this, it is a massive effort. But when you have a tool like D&D Beyond, it is very fast. Now, if you don't have Beyond 20, which is a Chrome extension that allows you to use D&D Beyond content on different virtual tabletops, then you won't see all these like little red D20s here. Those are for if I want to use Beyond 20 to cast this spell, I can just click those and get those rolls on the VTT. And then the last one I tend to use a lot is sources. And that basically just is going to give me the books. So if I want to look at something in the player's handbook, maybe I want to look at the equipment list. So I can click on player's handbook and then it brings up the contents and then I can find weapons and then it'll bring up the weapon chart. So I use this a fair bit as well. Uh, if you know where rule is, it's a lot easier to look up this way than their search engine. Now, the one thing I'm super experienced at on D&D Beyond is, of course, making characters. So I, I could just click create a character here. Uh, I could also go into tools and do character builder. Uh, the way I'm just kind of used to doing it is I go into collections and click my characters, and then I am going to select make a new character. So. Here we go. So if you watch this channel, you've seen me do this many, many times, but uh, I just wanna go over some of the options you have. I think the character builder function of D&D Beyond is maybe the best thing in the entire service. So it says to choose your character creation method, standard, quick build, or randomize. I have never used quick build and I have never used randomize, so I don't know how they work or what they do. I always use standard. Now I noticed that they add a show help text option here that I have never used. But what I'll tell you is you probably don't need it because this is really, really user friendly. So we'll go ahead and pick standard. 
What you can see is at the top, we have a bunch of headers here. Home, race, class, abilities, description, equipment, and what's next. And then it kind of shows a character sheet here that is currently grayed out because there is no character. So the home page, uh, this is where we're going to always start uh, because this kind of sets up the parameters for making the character. So you can enter your character's name. Uh, we'll just go John. Um, you can enter a picture for your character and you can choose from one of their pictures or you can upload one of your own. Uh, we'll just choose this one. Then it's going to allow you to determine which sources you're going to be able to use and that includes homebrew. So the way this works is as I build my character it's going to show me all the options that are available for each uh, feature that I am selecting and the options that it shows me are based on what I've picked here with sources. So right now anything from Eberron, it's going to show up. So if I want to make a background or I'm choosing a background, the Eberron backgrounds will be there. If they're not allowed in your campaign, then you want to turn this off and then you will have only the options that are available to you show up. Here are the other options you can set up on the home screen. So you can choose whether you want to use digital dice. So right now I have digital dice turned on. I'll leave it turned on so I can show you that. Optional class features, so these are from Tasha's Cogent of Everything. So you can choose whether or not you have optional class features and customize your origin. Then advancement types, so you can choose whether you are tracking your experience points or whether you're just leveling up. So if you're just leveling up, choose Milestone. If you are tracking experience points, then it will give you an experience point tracker. I'll turn that on so I can show you that. Then hit point type. If you choose manual, then that allows you to set your hit points yourself. So if you're rolling dice, and I believe you can use the automatic die roller for that as well if you want, uh, or if your DM has some kind of homebrew. Like I played in a campaign where the DM said you get maximum hit points at every level. I had to choose manual here, otherwise it was going to reset my hit points to the fixed amount, which is, of course, half your level plus one. So we'll go ahead and select fixed. Um, maybe actually I should select manual so I can show you that. The use prerequisites part, this is just for homebrew. So a common homebrew is DMs who say you don't have to meet multi-class requirements. So if you want to multi-class into Paladin, you don't need to have that strength of 13. So you will choose whether or not you have multi-class requirements. If you have this turned on, then when you multi-class, it's going to show you which classes you qualify for and which ones you don't qualify for. If you have it turned off, you can just pick any class you want. Uh, same thing with feats. Some feats have prerequisites. If your DM doesn't care about those, then you can turn that off. Now the show leveled scale spells, what this does is on your character sheet, you're going to have a list of your spells and your spells are categorized by level. And if you have show leveled scale spells on, then what will happen is if you have a spell that scales up with level, so let's say you have Armor of Agathis, and each spell slot level, you cast it higher than its original, you get an additional five temporary hit points and it does an additional five damage. Well, if you have this turned on, if I look at my third level spell slots, it will show me Armor of Agathis and it'll show me that it would give me 15 temporary hit points. But what that also means is it'll show Armor of Agathis at each spell level. So it'll show my first level spells and my second level spells and my third level spells. So your list will be a lot longer, which can be more difficult to manage for some people. So you can just choose whether it's going to show you that or not. With encumbrance, basically, if you choose no encumbrance, then it does nothing with it. But if you choose to use encumbrance, it will track your weight for you. And if you are encumbered, it will apply the penalties on your character sheet. And then you can choose whether you're tracking coin weight or not as well. The ability score modifier display, this is basically, so when you write in, I mean, if you play on paper sheets, you know you have uh, the ability score spot and there's a little circle and there's a big square and some people like their ability score in the little circle and other people like their ability score in the big square. So you get to choose whether you want the modifiers on top or your ability scores on top. The top is the big square. So we'll leave our modifiers on top. I would like to have them bigger because they're the number that we tend to use. Now there is no need to do these in order. You can do them in any order you want. So if I want to jump ahead to ability scores, I can. And it will let me choose whether I'm using the standard array, the point by, or just entering my own scores. 
If you do use the point by or standard array, then it will do the calculations for you. So you can see it says I have 27 points remaining of 27. And if I raise my intelligence to 13, you can see my current points is now 22. So I can just keep raising things until I get to zero. Now, once we select our race and we get our racial ability scores, they will automatically appear here. Uh, another thing you can do is there is customization you can do. So if you maybe have something happen in your campaign and your strength drops to five, well, you could just go override score to five and you can see it'll change your strength. So we'll go back to racial choice and you can see here I can toggle whether I'm going to show legacy content or not. Uh, so I already showed you that the legacy content is all available to me, but if I toggle this, then it won't litter up my screen. Furthermore, I can limit the sources that it shows me as well. I never use this. I just scroll down till I find what I'm looking for. And if you're looking at a race like the Kenku and you don't remember what they have, you just click it once and it's going to bring up the confirm race screen. And then I can scroll down and I can see all the stuff that they get to decide if this is the race I want to choose or not. But in order to select it, I just click choose race. Now, whenever you make a selection of race or class, what it'll do is it'll list all the stuff you get with it. And if there is a selection you need to make, then it will have the little exclamation mark and the blue border. So that means that there's still some work for me to do for size and Kenku recall. So if we just click it, it opens it up and then it says you need to choose your character size. So we'll choose that. And then for Kenku Recall, click that, and it says that we have two skills to choose. And if I click it, it shows me all the options. Uh, so we'll just choose two skills. Once you've done your selections, then the blue borders are gone. So now you know you've done everything you need to do on this page. Now, this is a Monsters of the Multiverse race, and so there's no need for Customize Your Origin for it. So if I click Origin Manager, it says you have no available custom origins for this character. So let's go ahead and choose a player's handbook race, and then we will. So we're going to change our race, and let's just play, I don't know, a dwarf. So there's the dwarf, and we'll select hill dwarf. So we have the blue box for tool proficiency, but we're not going to do anything with this screen yet. If we're using Customize Your Origin, the first thing you want to do is go into Origin Manager and make your selections for things you want to change. So here is the option to change the ability score increase of two. Here is the option to change Dwarven combat training, the option to change tool proficiency, language, and our ability score increase of one. If I click them all, you'll see when I go back to racial trait, we're gonna have a whole bunch of blue boxes because now I need to make the selections. So if we're not gonna have the constitution plus two, what are we gonna have plus two? Let's go to the class screen now. So it asks us to choose our class. So we will choose, I uh, know, I'll just select randomly. We'll choose the Druid and you can see it says we are level one and we can change that to whatever level we want. And if we want to multi-class, we can click this and it says add another class. And it will tell us what classes are available to us. Now it's showing all the classes available because I had turned the multi-class requirements off. But of course, if you had the multi-class requirements on, then you would need to meet the ability scores. And any one you didn't qualify for, it would let you know on this screen that it's not available. But if we want a multi-class, say into Cleric, so then we add class and you can see we're level one Druid, level one Cleric. We have three tabs on each of them. So class features, and again, you have the blue box if you need to make selections. Optional feature manager, so this is for the optional class features. And if you click them, then they will appear in the class features tab. Wild Companion is a second level Druid feature, so if we go to level two, it should appear in our class features. And there it is. Spell selection, also really easy on D&D Beyond. So we click spells. It says you currently have no prepared spells. So we will press known spells. And what it does is it tells us you can have two cantrips, you currently have selected zero. You can have two prepared spells and you currently have selected zero. Then it lists all the druid spells for you and you can filter by spell level. So I only want to look at the cantrips. So I click that and this is now just the cantrips. And if I click them both, then it's both of them. And then I can switch it to the first level spells. So it just allows me to organize my choices. And 
by just clicking this down arrow, it'll give you a quick description of the spell. So it just helps you make those selections. So that is normally all you need to do. But if you have selected manual for hit points, you can adjust it right here. So we have manage hit points, click it, it says rolled XP, and we can just change that number. So let's say I rolled 22, then it's gonna change my maximum hit points, and then I just hit apply. The description tab is where we're gonna put our background as well as origin proficiencies like languages. Choose a simple weapon or tool, so we choose one of those, and languages, and we'll choose two of those. And then you can see we've got background right here, so it has all the printed backgrounds in the sources that we selected, or we can create a custom background. Uh, so if we choose a custom background, what it'll do is it gives us a configure, and we click that, we can name our background, but you don't have to. You can put a description to your background, but you don't have to. And then you can choose your proficiency language choices. So you click this, you can choose two skills and two tools, two skills and two languages, or two skills, one tool and one language. So let's choose two skills and two tools. Then we're gonna get a background feature, and this has to be a match to a background that already exists. So we just pick one of those, and background characteristics, same thing. Characteristics you don't have to pick unless you want to do like the random personality traits that you can have. Uh, if you do like those, then you'll need to select one. Once we've made those selections, we need to click save and then it's going to let us pick our skills and our tools. So it'll give us a list of everything we can choose from. Now, if you do like to put down like your character details and physical characteristics and personal characteristics and notes, this is where you would do it. The only one I tend to use is I'll use notes, um, and then that gives me a chance to, you know, write any personal notes that I want to remember, like, you know, characters' names or that kind of thing. I'll put it in ad notes. I'll also sometimes put like party treasure. I'll put it in ad notes as well, just so it's always there for me. Once we've done our first four, race, class, abilities, description, then we'll do equipment. And it'll let you start with either the gold or equipment. So if you want just the standard starting equipment for your class, you choose this one. And then it, any decisions you have to make, you can make them right here. If you choose gold, then you can either have it roll for you or you can just enter a specific amount if that's the case. And once you have your starting equipment, then if you have, say, a weapon, if you want it to show up as an option for you, you'll need to press wield. And if you are wearing armor, you will want to wear the armor so it shows up on your armor class. If you click these and turn them off, your armor class will be adjusted for it. Once you got your equipment done, your character is done. So then you can just click on the character sheet and it'll come up. All right, now if you don't like the look of this character sheet, you can customize it. So if we go up here to manage, this is where we can do all kinds of customization. So we can go back to manage character and levels if we gained a level or something like that. Uh, we can manage our experience points. This is how that works. So click it, and you're going to see we currently have 900 experience, and we're level 3. So let's say we just fought a monster, and we gained 500 experience points. We click 500, apply changes, and you can see the bar has moved. Now, for a lot of people, this is very white, right? So if you don't like it this bright, what you can do is change sheet appearance. Uh, and there's this underdark mode that I pretty much always turn on. So if we turn it on, just a lot easier on the eyes. And then there's other customizations you can do as well. So for example, you can see that our portrait is in this red box. If you want that to be different, you can do that. You can even have like fancy ones. So here's a list that they give me and boy, there's a lot of them. Um, but here we got animated cauldron. So if I click that, you can see my character portrait is now in an animated cauldron. What you can also change is if you don't like this background, like this has the druid background, you can change it to a solid color or a different picture. Uh, the red borders here, you can make them pretty much any color you want. Uh, so you can make this look however really you like. But let's talk a little bit about how it works. So first I wanna talk about the digital dice. So let's say you're not using physical dice and you wanna roll a die on this character sheet. So if I want to make an athletics check, and boy, this character currently has a terrible athletics because I changed my strength to five, but if I have to make an athletics check, what I would do is put my cursor over the minus three, click it, 
and you can see it rolls the die and it gives me the result uh, and this says virtual tabletop not found because I have beyond 20 on right now if I turned it off it wouldn't bother saying that but it would still give me the result if I had a virtual tabletop open in another tab the result would appear on the virtual tabletop over here on the right we have a bunch of headers actions spells inventory features traits description notes and extras actions you'll probably want to keep up a lot uh, that's where you're going to have your weapon attacks and I do want to talk a little bit about weapon attacks because a lot of times we'll want to have custom options so whether you have great weapon master or sharpshooter or you use a house rule this is how I deal with it so I would go to inventory and I've got a great sword here uh, so here I've got great sword plus five to hit for 2d6 plus three it does not list a great weapon master option whether you have the feet or not so you go to inventory you're gonna manage inventory you can add a second great sword so we'll just do a search for a great sword add it and we'll add it to equipment and you can see now I've got two listed great swords and I will wield them both then I go to actions and you can see I've got great sword now listed twice so then what I do is I just click on great sword and we'll see over here on the right I can customize one of them and I'll put it to hit bonus of minus five and a damage bonus of plus ten and then I'll want to list it as something different so I'll go great weapon master great sword and if I click off of it we can see now I've got great sword with my usual bonuses and great weapon master great sword with my adjusted bonuses so then if I roll on this one it is going to give me my results so that's the easier way to do that now if you want to actually add a new action so let's say we picked up a summoning spell and we wanted to have damage for the summoning spell that we could roll off our character sheet then what we do is we click manage custom right over here and then we're going to add new actions uh, and then we can choose general or spell or weapon so the summon creature is making weapon attack so we would click weapon then we have custom action number one we can click on that and we can click edit and there are all kinds of stuff that we can edit on it uh, so let's start with a name so we'll say summon attack and then the attack type you can leave that blank but you could also put it as natural or unarmed strike if that's applicable we would want to enter the range so let's say it is a ranged attack so we would click ranged and then we can enter the range right here so maybe short range is 60 feet and long range is 120 feet then we would want to enter how much damage it does so the die type is what you have to enter first uh, dice count you enter second if you enter dice count now and then do die type it'll reset your dice count to one so let's say this thing does 3d8 damage say 3d8 plus 10 damage so we go die type 8 then dice count 3 then fix value 10 and that will give us a 3d8 plus 10 damage then when we make attack rolls uh, so let's say we're using our spell attack and let's say we're using our uh, intelligence modifier so we would use intelligence here a stat and we would click that we are proficient and then that would give us the correct attack roll if there's DCs you can enter them here if there's an AOE you can enter the shape of it and the size of it we can let it know whether it's an action or a bonus action or a reaction I guess in this case it wouldn't be any of those so we'll leave it blank and the final thing you definitely want to do is put it displays attack otherwise it will not show up on your character sheet once that is done we can just click off it and if we scroll down we should find it and there it is summon attack plus four to hit 3d8 plus 12 damage and I realized it was supposed to be 3d8 plus 10 and I got my mistake all right so sometimes you make a mistake and the mistake I made here I can tell right away is because it's based off intelligence it's adding my intelligence bonus to the damage so then I would want to reduce the fixed value by two to make sure that this is correct and then once it's correct we can just click it and we'll get our summon creature attack and then we'll get our result so those are two ways I customize actions uh, the other thing that I often use is the customization of my feats because I have been in several campaigns where DMs will give a bonus feat at level one when that happens you can add it to your character sheet on D&D Beyond but not through the regular character builder because with the regular character builder it's doing it by the rules as they're written if you have a house rule where you're adding a feat then what you do is you go to features and traits 
and then we're going to scroll down to the bottom and go to manage feats and then let's say we got the dual wielder feet so then we just click add and we've got dual wielder now if you add something that has like an ability score modifier or maybe there's some kind of choice to make uh, so let's go ahead and choose fey touched uh, we'll take fey touched intelligence you're going to see it's going to show the exclamation mark saying you still have selections to make and we just click the down arrow here and then it's because we have to choose our spell so then we have the options for spells and we can go through the list see what we want we'll take hideous laughter in this case and now the feats have been added dual wielder there fade touch there so i find the dnd beyond character builder to be by far the easiest way certainly for me as an optimizer to make characters because it narrows down those selections and gives us all the information we need filters our results I used to flip through books to do character builds and it took me 10 times as long and the builds weren't as good. So it is extremely good for building characters. But what I also use D&D Beyond for all the time is for the character sheet itself. Uh, so here is the character sheet and if I am playing in person or online, my preferred method is to use my D&D Beyond character sheet. Now, if I play in person, I'll usually just bring a tablet with me so that I can access it and I can basically get this sheet. Though you can use your phone, though keep in mind it'll be more condensed and you'll have more screens to flip through. But on your tablet, this is pretty close to what you get and this is my PC screen right now. So let's say I'm playing in person and the advantages are, so let's say I use my wild shape. I can just click here and keep track of that. Uh, and then let's say I use some spells. So let's click off some spells and let's say I take some damage. So let's say I take, I don't know, 10 points of damage. So we'll click 10, click damage, and I'll keep track of my current hit points. And then when I take a long rest, I can just click on long rest here, take long rest, confirm, and everything's back. My hit points are back, my spell slots are back, and my wild shapes will be back as well. Uh, so I just find that really easy. I also find it very easy, like if you are a spellcaster, remembering what every single spell does is difficult. Writing notes on your character sheet for all the descriptions of the spells is just not viable. So what we can do here is we can just click Misty Step and it will show us the spell description and all the relevant data. Same thing, if I forget what my feats do, I can click on Features and Traits and I can just scroll down and it'll tell me exactly what they do. So it is just way more rules at your fingertips right on your character sheet than you could possibly get through a PDF or paper. So if all of that sounds great to you, I should warn you about the disadvantages of using D&D Beyond because these are things you should know before you invest any money. The first thing to know is that sometimes they'll take down D&D Beyond for maintenance. Um, lately, I've found it's maybe once a week or so, they'll drop D&D Beyond for about 15 minutes for maintenance and you won't have access to D&D Beyond at all. That includes your character sheet. So if you're playing in person and then suddenly you need your character sheet and it's down for 15 minutes, well, you need a 15 minute break then because you're not going to be able to access your character sheet during that time. Though you can actually download a backup, which I forgot to mention when we were going over that. So. I'm just going to go back into my characters and show you how to do that. So here we go. It doesn't matter which character we use. We'll use this guy. So here I've got a character. And if I want a backup copy of it, I can get it through Manage. And then I can go down to here to Export to PDF. And then I can click that. And then I can just click to Download. And then I'll get a downloaded character sheet. Now this doesn't have the same functionality as D&D Beyond. It's just kind of your standard character sheet. Uh, which is fine to play in person. That's probably what you're using now if you don't use D&D Beyond. But if you want the full functionality of the character sheet, if the website is down, you won't have it until it's back up. Same thing can happen, of course, if you have a problem, like your internet goes down or you go somewhere that has bad Wi-Fi, then you might want to have this backup character sheet just in case. The other major issue with D&D Beyond is not everything works properly. So if we go into forums here and we go to bugs and support, the big one is Tasha's Cauldron of Everything. So this has been an issue for two years. There are some things in Tasha's that don't work. So if we click on this here, 
Most of what's listed here is just support, showing you how everything works, and that's all fine. Because, of course, when they add new source book and there's new options, and then there's new menus for selecting things, they need to give you a little bit of guidance on how to deal with it. But some stuff doesn't work. So, like, for example, with the fighter, fighting style, superior technique, not functional. So this is the uh, fighting style that gives you a battle maneuver and a superiority die to use it. If you select it on your character, you can select it, but your character sheet won't show it. Now, what you could do is you go into Manage Feats, and then you could take Martial Adept and take the correct fighting style, and it's going to give you the fighting style as well as the uh, die to use it. But you shouldn't have to do that, and in this case, the service lets you down. Another case, and the big case is with the Sorcerer. So these are easily the two most infamous bugs on D&D Beyond, the Aberrant Mind and Clockwork Soul Sorcerer. So Psionic Spells, we currently don't have a method to allow swapping these spells out. So they give you a base list and then you should be able to switch them out when you level up. Well, you can't on D&D Beyond. And that's a huge problem if you're playing either of these subclasses. Now, there are workarounds. What you can do is you can create a custom subclass and you can just take the Aberrant Mind and then you can switch out the spells on the custom subclass to be the spells that you wanted to take. And then you can apply that custom subclass and then you got your spells. Or you could do a custom magic item that provides you the spells that you wanted to switch to. Or what I do is you can rename your spells so that they're renamed to the correct spells. Though if you click them, they won't bring up the correct spell description. So there are workarounds, but it's extra work that you shouldn't have to do as a player. And you should also be aware that whenever a new book comes out, there's inevitably going to be a couple bugs for that as well. So we're just going to go back here, and the newest book right now is Dragonlance. And if we scroll down on this one, again, most of it is just support, and that's all just fine. But if we go down to subclass, the Lunar Sorcerer subclass is mostly supported. There are a few things to be aware of. Lunar Embodiment. If you wish to change your Lunar Phase, you need to do so via the Character Builder. So you can't change your Lunar Phase on your Character Sheet. Then Waxing and Waning. If you change the Lunar Phase after casting the first level spell, but before taking a long rest, the tracking for that phase's first level spell without expanding a spell slot will reset. So it's harder to keep track of. Uh, and again, these aren't like fatal flaws. You can still use your Lunar Sorcerer, but it's just inconveniences that are going to happen. Now, hopefully these won't be around for two years like the Tasha's Cauldron of Everything ones, but just be aware these are bugs and bugs tend to happen with the new source material. Now, to be fair, 99% of the stuff or probably more than 99% of the stuff works fine. You may make 10 characters and not run into a single problem. But if you find that there's something that doesn't seem to be working right on your character sheet, if you go to bugs and support, there's a good chance they already know about it and they'll tell you, uh, yeah, we're working on it. And maybe they're going to fix it, though in some cases, maybe not. And I should also mention as well, if you want to play test one D&D, the character sheets on D&D Beyond work really well if you're playing by the official rules if you're playing with house rules, now I've shown you some ways to customize already, but if you're playing with lots of house rules, the more house rules you have, the harder it is to use these, and they aren't set up to do the one D&D playtest. So for those kinds of things, then the D&D Beyond character sheet actually isn't all that great. Like if I am going to play one D&D, I'd probably use the Roll20 character sheet, which is super customizable, rather than use the D&D Beyond character sheet and then go through all the pain of trying to customize it, and some of it will work and some of it won't. But regardless of your decision, hopefully you are more informed now on how D&D Beyond works, the service it provides. It's not just digital books. It's giving you a service in addition to that. Now, there's been talk about the virtual tabletop that they're working on for D&D Beyond that currently does not exist. So don't expect a virtual tabletop here. The services that I've mentioned in this video, those are the services that are currently available. When the virtual tabletop does come out, I will certainly take a look at it and I will certainly talk about it on this channel so you can decide if that's something that you are interested in or not. But I doubt very highly it's going to be a required thing to use D&D Beyond because as you can see, D&D Beyond has a lot of uses beyond just using it in a virtual tabletop. I know this has been a hefty video and you know it could have been even heftier 
because there's just so much details that the Indie Beyond provides. And if you are a rules wonk like I am, I think it is well worth the money personally, especially if you like making characters and you like building encounters. Uh, those two services I find D and D Beyond. I just don't see replication elsewhere. But regardless of what you decide, thank you for joining me. Otherwise, until next time, I am going to sit back, relax, and have some fun. D and D is for everyone. Thanks, everybody. Talk to you soon. Mm -hmm.